Good afternoon, everyone, from a southern, um, a southern African perspective here in Johannesburg, where it's nice and sunny. We have a few international participants. So um, good evening, good morning to you wherever you are um, in the world. Welcome for joining um, this session today. We are very glad that you are here. We will be discussing today rare earth elements with Prof. Kirsten Forsberg, um, who is from KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, today's webinar is one of several leading up to the Southern African Rare Earth International Conference that is scheduled for the 18th to the 20th of October this year. We look forward to seeing everyone there, either online or in person for this hybrid conference. Now, today's discussion is um, very interesting. Um, Prof. Kirsten Forsberg will be discussing anti-solvent crystallization for the recovery of rare earth elements. Now, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about Prof. Um, Forsberg. She's an associate professor in chemical engineering and has expertise in separation processes, in particular crystallization. She leads KTH's participation in several European collaboration projects. She's also the head of the Division of Resource Recovery at the Department of Chemical Engineering since 2016. And she is the Deputy Director for the KTH Industrial Transformation Platform. The platform was created in 2019 and covers one of six focus areas for multidisciplinary research at KTH. She represents the School of Engineering Sciences in Chemistry, um, Biotechnology and Health as a member of the management team for the Initiative on Circular Economy at KTH. She is Program Director for the Master's Program in Chemical Engineering for Energy and Environment since um, July 2019. And since last year, she represents KTH as an expert in the Technical Committee on Circular Economy at the Swedish Institute for Standards and with active participation in the work on a global level in circular economy within the International Organization for Standardization. We are so honored to have you here, um, Prof. Kiersberg, Prof. Um, Kirsten. One um, aspect that I would like to address with the participants, please. Um, during the chat, if you can please post questions to Prof. Forsberg on the Q&A tab, not the, the chat, please. They tend to get lost there very quickly. So the Q&A tab, please use them for all your questions, and then we will address them after the discussion. Prof. Forsberg, we look forward to your discussion, and it's over to you. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here today uh, to give a presentation to all of you. Um, so let's see uh, if I can share my screen then. Uh, I'm here in a snowy Stockholm at the moment. Um, let's see, share screen, that one, share and uh, presentation and I'm just going to make everything all right on my screen oops sorry that's fine oh. okay so uh, welcome I think I'm all set um, so my name is Kerstin Forsberg. I work as an associate professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. And I'm here today to give a presentation on uh, anti-solvent crystallization for recovery of rare earth elements. So let's see. First, a few words about uh, our university, KTH. It's located in uh, Stockholm. Uh, just outside the city centre of Stockholm, you can see our main courtyard here in the picture. And here you can see where Stockholm is located in, in Sweden. Uh, so, uh, I work together with my colleagues here uh, on the, in the par Department of Chemical Engineering and we focus on separation processes. Uh, so we have been working with many different separation techniques like crystallization, chromatographic separation of rare earth elements, uh, adsorption also of rare earth elements in, in particular, 
uh, and uh, also supported liquid membrane extraction, which is a specific type of solvent extraction operation. Uh, but today I will focus on uh, crystallization and precipitation of rare earth elements. Um, and, and this is uh, my main focus area as well, uh, to work on crystallization and precipitation. Uh, so I'm sure that you all are aware a little bit about the principles of crystallization. So it's the separation of a component from a crystal, uh, as a crystalline solid phase from a solution or a melt. Uh, and as in any separation uh, process, uh, of course, capacity, yield and purity is important in your uh, process. Uh, but for crystallization, there are also some specific physical properties of the crystals that are very important to consider when you develop your process. So, uh, of course, you can choose which compound you want to crystallize. So if you are looking at the rare earths, they can be precipitated uh, as different compounds. Um, they could be polymorphs um, that you have to take into consideration. Um, size and size distribution are important, especially when it comes to the downstream processing of uh, filtration and washing of your crystals, where you can have also uh, introduction of uh, impurities into your solids. Uh, crystal shape is also important, uh, connects also back to the downstream processing a lot. Um, and agglomeration is also something that you might have to consider. And here you see some crystals from our work. Uh, the upper crystal, uh, crystals here are actually a scandium phase, ammonium scandium hexafluoride. I will talk a little bit about this particular compound later today. And then here we have some crystals of uh, chromium fluoride hydrates. Uh, these are obtained from pickle bath acids because we had a project where we wanted to uh, recycle pickle bath acids of, of the pickling of stainless steel by crystallization. Um, okay, so we often apply our knowledge in separation processes uh, in order to develop different processes for recovery of resources from various waste streams. Because here often you have many challenges uh, that are very interesting for a chemical engineer to look at. Um, we would like to think that waste is what is left when imagination fails. Um, so we want to recycle as much as possible. And for us, it is very interesting to develop new sustainable processes for resource recovery then from all these different types of waste streams that we have in our society today. Um, yes. So, because our modern society today is uh, using a lot of essential metals, um, so they exist uh, in many of the products and applications that we use every day in a mobile phone, in, in different types of batteries, you have different elements and uh, metals that you want to recycle back. Um, normally you extract these metals from minerals, of course, and you get your metals and you use them and then if they end up in nature through corrosion and wear, eventually they will go through a mineralization and become minerals again. But as you know, this cycle is very, very slow. Um, and, and we work a lot with this small cycle in the middle here, the recycling. So we want to get some of the metals back into the cycle here through recycling of all the items that we are using in our daily life. And of course, in these recycling processes, you use the same type of uh, separation techniques and processes as, as you do in, in metal extraction from minerals, the ores. So then another uh, important concept here are uh, critical raw materials. Um, because critical raw materials are uh, those essential materials uh, for near, nearly all our electronic life saving and green technologies that we have today. So these are materials that have a high economic importance, but at the same time there is a high supply risk. And that is where the criticality comes in. So the European Union has uh, uh, put together a list of uh, 30 critical raw materials that are critical for the European Union uh, when it comes to economic importance and supply risk. Um, but of course, you find the same type of materials uh, as critical also in other parts of the world. It's, it's similar for also for Africa, Australia, 
uh, America, etc. And on this list, you will find rare elements. They are very critical because they are very important. And at the same time, there is a, a, a high risk of supply risk, <laughs> high supply risk. And today uh, we focus on the rare elements. Uh, rare elements can be found in many different uh, applications. Uh, it can be used together with, scandium, uh, together with aluminium. Scandium can be used uh, to create very strong and light alloys of interest in, in, uh, for aircraft industry. Uh, scandium can also be used uh, in solid oxide fuel cells. Um, then you have a number of rare earth elements uh, in use for nickel metal hydride batteries. Uh, a very important application today for rare earth elements are in very strong uh, permanent magnets that find many uses today. Uh, for example, uh, in wind, wind turbines. And then also some of the earth elements are used for in, in luminescence uh, applications. Uh, so we really need the rare earth elements today and we find them in many different uh, items. And let's look at the rare earth elements position in the periodic table of the elements. So here is where you have the rare earth elements. Uh, these are the whole lanthanide series uh, where you have lanthanum and here all the way from cerium to lutetium. And also you often group yttrium and scandium. Uh, as rare earth elements together with the lanthanides. And this is because uh, they are, have very similar properties. Uh, they are all trivalent ions in aqueous solutions normally, uh, and they have a very similar ionic radius and similar bonding properties as well. Uh, why the lanthanide ions have similar ionic radius uh, is due to the, their electronic structure and the lanthanide contraction, which makes that when you go along the series, due to the lanthanide contraction, that the, the, the size of the ions, the trivalent ions in, in the aqua solution is very similar, actually. Um, and yes, sometimes cerium can appear as a tetravalent ion and europium can be reduced in it, into its divalent state and, and, and be stable like that in aqueous solution. And this is uh, often a way to separate these particular uh, rare earth elements from the others by using the redox. Um, and you often group them into the light and heavy group, which have slightly different properties. And sometimes you can do rough uh, separations of the light ones from the heavy ones due to their slightly different uh, properties then where the heavy ones are slightly smaller uh, and, and the light ones are slightly larger. And normally yttrium is grouped uh, with the heavy ones and scandium is grouped uh, with the light ones, which ha they have similar, more, uh, slightly more similar properties. Um, looking at the relative abundance of the elements and, and placing the earth elements here together with other elements, you can see that they are not really very rare. Uh, they are not among the rarest metals actually in Earth's uh, upper crust, uh, but they are on the other hand often found together and they are found at quite low concentrations, so they are not so easy to extract anyway. And there is also one important thing uh, worth mentioning uh, regarding uh, the so-called balance problem, and this is because they are often found together if you want to um, produce, uh, for example, dysprosium or neodymium that is used to a large extent in, in magnets, since they are found, found together in the ores, uh, when you want to produce dysprosium, you will also get a proportional amount of the other earth elements uh, from your process. So this means that, that um, some of the earth elements like dysprosium and neodymium are driving, uh, the market, and then you could actually get some of the other earth elements stockpiled because you get them at the same time when you, when you extract these more, even more valuable earth elements. And that is the balance problem. Looking at separation of rare earth elements, we have this famous quote from Callow uh, from the 60s that uh, discussing lanthanum separation is like discussing chess. 
there are a limited number of opening moves, which can then be analyzed in detail. But at, as the game develops, possibilities multiply enormously. And it's quite interesting. And, and you can, of course, um, take the example of um, extraction of the red elements from a waste stream in a similar way. So that first you have your waste material and maybe in the beginning you want to leach and you have a certain number of acids to choose from and the certain conditions. But then uh, as you develop your process, there are many different alternatives on which elements to separate first and which technique to use, etc. So it can become very complicated. And it is not at all obvious how to process a certain waste stream in order to recover the elements that you want to recover in the end. And also you have to think, should I recover the red elements as a group or should I separate them into individual fractions? What is the most, uh, the best uh, approach act actually? It is uh, not obvious. And so, we had one pro uh, project where we wanted to, to look at the recovery of valuable elements from nickel metal hydride car batteries. This project uh, was, uh, uh, there was a, we had a, a, a PhD student, Kivansh Kotmas, who worked very actively in, in this project. Um, and here we looked at, first, of course, we characterized the material, the anode and cathode. And uh, in these nickel metal hydride batteries, you have a lot of nickel and cobalt that are, uh, are very valuable. And also a number of different rare elements at very high concentrations, so they should really be recovered. And, and we looked at different uh, process options, how to do that, how to recover the rare elements uh, as a group, uh, together as a concentrate, and, and uh, even if we perhaps separate them from each other also in the end. And um, uh, yes, let's see. This was the aim of the project. And we also had a life cycle assessment part where we wanted to uh, compare really the different process alternatives that we came up with. And in this uh, project, we uh, investigated this approach as one of the approaches. Uh, here we had electrode uh, materials uh, and we, we use sulfuric acid for leaching in the first step at a slightly elevated temperature. We only got a small uh, solid residue in the leaching stage. Uh, in the next stage, we had a precipitation by adding sodium hydroxide. We could precipitate the earth elements as a concentrate as sodium earth double sulfate monohydrates. Uh, quite pure concentrate. Uh, this particular solid phases had very low solubility uh, uh, also under quite acidic conditions. So it's important to, to notice here that we don't add sodium hydroxide to increase the pH necessarily in this step. The, the main thing here is to add the sodium ions to precipitate the sodium rare double sulfate salt. Um, this can be done also under uh, quite acidic conditions. But then in the next step, uh, we add more sodium hydroxide uh, to precipitate the nickel and cobalt and also some zinc as hydroxides. Uh, and here, uh, if you take care about the conditions and if you dose uh, these elements in, in the right proportions, you can even consider to, to um, crystallize these spherical nickel hydroxide particles uh, doped with certain amounts of cobalt and zinc that could actually be used in the production and manufacturing of new battery materials. Um, so we, we looked at this process and the overall recovery of the earth elements was, was good and the purity was fine. Um, and we found that the leaching here with sulfuric acid was limited by precipitation of rare sulfate hydrates, actually. Because when we have slightly high temperature, uh, especially then the rare sulfate hydrates uh, precipitated because the solubility of this phase actually decreases as the temperature increases. And also, of course, at quite high sulfuric acid uh, concentration, we could see a tendency of this salt uh, precipitating. Uh, so uh, we thought that actually this is a better end product that, than the sodium salt, because here, if you have this end product, you will not have any sodium in your uh, rare earth concentrate. And the rare sulfate hydrates have, have quite a high solubility in aqueous solution, 
which could be very good if you want to continue to process, because then you can easily dissolve this uh, rare sulfate uh, salt and, and continue to process to separate them from each other by, for example, chromatographic uh, separation. Uh, but just changing the conditions in the leaching stage, increasing the temperature or, or really increasing the sulfuric acid concentration a lot is not really a viable option to, to obtain these rare sulfate hydrates because the solubility is still too high and it's not a good uh, option. So we thought maybe how could we obtain this solid phase uh, in, in some other way? Um, yes. And then uh, yeah, you just look at the solubility of these rare sul sulfate hydrates. Uh, here you can see the solubility in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius. It is plotted as a gram per kilo of just the rare earth, this, each rare earth element in water in equilibri equilibrium with their, this solid phase. And you can see here the solubility of these elements then in terms of the total rare earth concentration. And uh, there is a, a trend along the series. Uh, there is a nice funny bend here. It has to do with that we have different solid phases for along the series because this lanthanum and cerium that these ions are slightly larger than the other ones and they are stable as a nonahydrate while the other elements here are most stable as an octahydrate in equilibrium with water at 25 degrees Celsius. But you can see that the solubility is still quite high. So it is good. And uh, if we have this solid phase, we can dissolve in water and continue to process. So we considered anti-solvent crystallization in uh, order to obtain these uh, uh, salts. So this is a crystallization technique that, that is widely used in the pharmaceutical industry that could potentially be of interest also in separation of rare earth elements. Uh, it is based on adding a second solvent that is totally miscible with the first solvent in order to decrease the solubility of the, the compound that you want to crystallize. So if you have here a solubility curve for a, a specific substance in an initial solvent, uh, it could be water or sulfuric acid in, in, in water, uh, and you have temperature and concentration here, and then you add a second uh, solvent, for example, an alcohol, um, and then uh, the solubility curve is shifted because the compound has, in this case, a lower solubility in the new solvent mixture. And in this way, you generate a supersaturation and you crystallize your compound out. That is what you want to achieve. And in our case, we want to crystallize the earth elements as sulfate hydrates. Uh, the earth elements are uh, initially uh, dissolved in water and sulfuric acid. This is the initial solvent. And then it is appropriate in our case to add an alcohol because these um, rare earth sulfates have a very low solubility in a pure alcohol. And when you add an alcohol, they will, uh, the, the solubility of them will decrease. And why is it so? Well, water can attract and form layers surrounding both negatively and positively charged ions, uh, and thus uh, keep them apart. And this is reflected in the very high dielectric constant of water, which connects to the polarizability of water. Uh, alcohols, on the other hand, have lower dielectric constants than water, and it means that they have a lower ability to keep charged ions apart. Um, okay, so we took our uh, sulfuric acid leach liquor after uh, leaching the electrode materials in sulfuric acid. Uh, this is our original leach liquor <clears throat> and we had a lot of different elements here in the leach liquor. We had, you can see here, uh, many rare earths, cerium, neodymium, praseodymium and yttrium and we also had man manganese, cobalt, aluminium and nickel. Nickel isn't plotted here because it was present at much higher concentration, but we also have a high concentration of nickel here. So on the y-axis you have the concentration of all these elements in uh, total concentration in grams per liter. Uh, and on the x-axis you can see 
the volumetric ratio of O, which is an, orga an organic phase, in this case ethanol, and A, which is the original aqueous uh, strip liquor. <clears throat> so it shows what happens here when you add more and more ethanol to your solution. Uh, but the concentration here is in gram per liter of original leach liquor, which means that you will not see the dilution here that appears when you, you add ethanol. So it means that the concentration will be constant if you don't have any uh, crystallization, nearly constant. It is plotted in that way. And you can see uh, when we add a little bit of ethanol, uh, we don't see any decrease in any of the concentrations. So it means that we still have an undersaturated solution at this point. But then when we add a little bit more of ethanol, we see that the concentration of the root elements start to decrease while the other elements concentrations remain um, as so they are not precipitated and we also see a precipitate and when we continue to add the ethanol the concentrations decrease more and more uh, and and we get actually a rare earth uh, con uh, concentrate solid concentrate um, and when we characterized this solid we found that it was rare earth sulfate hydrates that precipitated um, up to this point, we can do that. Then we see that the concentration of cobalt starts to decrease. And it's not visible in this diagram, but the nickel concentration also starts to decrease at this point. And this means that here we start to uh, pollute our uh, solids with these elements as well. So we have to stop uh, if we want to have a high purity. We can gain a little bit of yield, but uh, at the expense of the purity of the solid rare earth concentrate. We also investigated this a little bit more in detail um, here. Uh, so here you have um, results for cerium and lanthanum when we have added, here is the ethanol concent alcohol concentration on the x-axis in moles per liter, but it is uh, concentration of ethanol and pro two propanol. And this is the concentration of the rare earth elements uh, in millimole per liter initial aqueous solution. And you can see that when we add more alcohol, the concentrations decreases because they precipitate. Uh, we can also see here that the rare earth concentration is higher in ethanol than in 2-propanol. And this is uh, in correlation with, if you also compare the dielectric constants of these two solvents, uh, we see that ethanol has a slightly higher dielectric constant than 2-propanol at 25 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature of these experiments. So it's reasonable. And we can see that the lightest lanthanide, uh, lanthanum, uh, is present at the highest concentration. Uh, and if we compare more earth elements, it is the same trend. I'm a little bit careful in not writing solubility here. Even though we waited for a long time, when we characterized the solids, we saw that we actually tended to have a, uh, a mixture of different uh, hydrates of the rare, rare earth sulfates. Uh, so I wouldn't really call it solubility data, but the trends are still uh, relevant here. Um, but one has to be a little bit careful because you could have end up with different hydrates. Also, of course, we could expect different hydrates to be stable um, when we add more and more of the alcohol. We could have perhaps uh, expect lower hydrates to appear. And there could be, if you have very high alcohol concentration, there could also be a risk for solvates uh, appearing. And it's good to be aware of that, even though we didn't find it in our experiments. So summarizing here a little bit, uh, we see that rare elements can be selectively separated from the leach liquor with a quite high yield, uh, remaining a high purity. If we want to have a higher yield, we can have that, but at the expense of the purity, uh, then by adding an al alcohol. The rare elements are mainly obtained as rare earth, uh, sulfate hydrates with high solubility in water, which is a very good point here. Uh, looking at the choice of antisolvent economy, availability of the, the solvents, antisolvents are important and the safety of course of those. But we should also consider the recovery because 
after the precipitation. We want to recover, separate the alcohol from the aqueous solution again and to recover both the acid and the, the, the alcohol. And as I'm sure you know that alcohol and water can be uh, separated by distillation. So this is one approach to recover back the alcohols after the antisolvent crystallization. Um, we have also been working with the recovery of scandium from red mud in a, a, as part of a larger Horizon 2020 funded project called SCALE. Here we have uh, our colleague uh, and PhD student Edward Peters who have been uh, mainly worked with this topic. Um, and we have, here is the whole, starting with the bauxite residue, uh, acidic leaching, solvent extraction and stripping that was done in Germany by the company MIAP. And then at Cotihu, we focused on this part, the antisolvent crystallization of ammonium scandium hexafluoride. And we received the strip liquors from Germany. Um, and, and our goal was to separate scandium from the strip liquors in a phase that was suitable for production of scandium metal later. And when you produce scandium metal, you want to have, uh, well, a scandium three fluoride is something good to have. So we looked at crystallizing scandium fluoride phases and we found that by antisolvent crystallization we can obtain uh, ammonium scandium hexafluoride uh, which you then can heat and you will get scandium 3 fluoride which is very good when you want to produce a scandium metal in the large low stage. So uh, in the beginning we investigated this solid phase ammonium scandium hexafluoride and the solubility uh, under different conditions to see uh, and to find the best approach to crystallize this compound. So uh, we did uh, some solubility measurements looking at the whole the colder temperature range here because in this case the solubility increases with an increase in temperature. And we also looked at the solubility in mixtures of different um, antisolvents like uh, in this case ethanol. And as you can see uh, when adding ethanol, you can reach much lower uh, concentrations than when just cooling the solution. The, the cooling curve here, the solubility as a function of temperature is not very steep, so it's not the best option, even though we did some cooling crystallization uh, experiments as well to compare with the antisolvent crystallization approach. And here you can see some crystals from uh, cooling crystallization and antisolvent crystallization. You see the crystals we obtain from cooling crystallization are generally larger than those we obtain by antisolvent crystallization. And this is antisolvent crystallization by just adding a lot of antisolvent, um, not really taking care of the addition rate and, and seeding, etc. But still, it is true that by antisolvent crystallization, it's a greater risk to, achieve, to obtain smaller, uh, smaller crystals. Because as when you add the antisolvent to, to your aqueous solution, you have a very high um, supersaturation at the addition point with the alcohol in, to the, the solution. While, while, while you cool, uh, you can do it more carefully and you seed uh, and then the, the, the crystals grow. And, and it is easier to obtain larger crystals. Um, but of course, you will have higher yields more easily with the antisolvent crystallization technique. And here we investigated the solubility of the solid phase um, for different concentrations of ammonium fluoride in ethanol. And as you can see, uh, when we have higher concentration of ammonium fluoride, the solubility uh, decreases in all conditions. Uh, it is perhaps uh, what is expected and it also is true uh, in mixtures with ethanol. Um, and we looked at the effect of temperature in um, aqueous alcohol mixtures and you can see that the trend with temperature is the same as when you don't have any antisolvent present. Uh, it is so that the solubility decreases when the temperature decreases, uh, but the difference is not really much larger than when you don't have any antisolvent there. And then we compared different alcohols with each other. And 
you can find the dielectric constants of the pure alcohols in literature, but here we wanted to compare um, the different cases where you have an antisolvent together with the aqueous ammonium fluor fluoride solution. And so we, we just calculated um, by assuming um, that they, have an, uh, they are additive, uh, the, um, the effective dielectric constant for these mixtures to be able to compare. So by doing that, we could calculate the effective dielectric constant for mixtures of the antisolvents with ammonium fluoride solutions, and we can compare them to see what we would expect from our experiments, theoretically. And then if we look at the results, we can see that the, the same trend are obtained in the experimental results as what we would expect by comparing the effective dielectric constants that we've calculated by that sim uh, simple formula. Um, and the difference is perhaps not huge, but there is still a difference depending on which antisolvent you use. Uh, you get different solubilities of the ammonium scandium hexafluoride for the same uh, alcohol concentration. And it can be predicted by the effective dielectric constants. Then, let's see. We also, uh, in this project, looked a little bit about uh, on uh, impurities, because we will have some impurity elements also coming from uh, the solvent extraction operation still in the striplica. So here we could find uh, elements such as titanium, zirconium, iron, even thorium. And then we wanted to see what happens with the, the impurity elements when we crystallize scandium by this method. And so firstly, we just did some rough uh, crystallization experiments by adding the antisolvent and just checking what happened with the, all these elements when we crystallize scandium. And we could see that we do uh, end up with um, uh, zirconium, for example, iron and thorium in, in the solid phase. Uh, in this case, titanium doesn't really precipitate. Um, and okay, so we had to look into more carefully what happens with the, the impurities and why can we find them uh, sometime in the, in the solid phase and is that something that we can work with and improve in the design of our process. Um, so then, of course, we have to consider the different mechanisms, possible mechanisms of impurity incorporation. Uh, in crystallization, you can introduce impurities into your end product by different mechanisms. One thing is that you can have solution adhering to the surface of your crystals. This can be uh, uh, improved by looking at washing and centrifugation of your crystals. You can also have macroscopic inclusions, um, that is if you have pockets of mother liquor in between the crystals, for example, or if you have agglomerates and such. Uh, this can be improved by maybe working with crushing, reslurring and washing of your crystals. Uh, you could have microscopic inclusions, which are kind of small pockets of mother liquor inside of the crystals. This is perhaps not so common in hydrometallurgy. It could be more common in the pharmaceutical industry, but there it happens and you can um, improve it by working with sweeting and reslurrying and kind of dissolving and recrystallizing the, the, the crystals. Uh, what is more important in hydrometallurgy perhaps is lattice incorporation, which is due to a mo mo molecular resemblance of the, the elements that you want to crystallize that under certain conditions, um, some impurity elements are introduced into the crystal structure of the, the main component. And this can be uh, also handled by sweeting and fractional crystallization potentially. It depends a little bit because lattice incorporation can be either kinetically uh, um, introduced or it can be thermodynamically uh, introduced. So. Uh, if you have kinetically controlled um, lattice impurity incorporation or incorporation by these pockets, uh, 3D inclusions, or by adhesion of mother liquor, uh, all these uh, can be influenced by modifying the crystallization con uh, conditions or downstream processes. 
so for example, um, if you have a slow growth rate, you can enhance uh, purity. Uh, but of course, it is negative for your productivity. Uh, if you have an effective mixing, you can enhance your purity. If you have very small crystals, maybe the mixing on a macroscopic level is not too important because the crystals will go with the flow kind of, but for, for larger crystals it's more important. Uh, you should avoid agglomeration, of course. Um, you should aim at a suitable crystal size distribution and shape to improve the, the washing and filtration stages. Uh, but then you could also have the formation of a solid solution, and this is a thermodynamically controlled process, and though it is um, more difficult to do anything about that, uh, then that is when you can perhaps consider fractional crystallization to improve the purity instead. So it is important to understand the mechanism of how your impurities are um, ending up in the solid product. And there are many times uh, lots of things that you can do to control the crystallization process and to, to avoid having these impurities introduced into your solid phase. Uh, so if we look at antisolvent crystallization, uh, considering both thermodynamics and kinetics, some uh, aspects are more important. So of course, the choice of antisolvent is important and there you can look at the solubility of all the different uh, possible uh, compounds crystallizing. Um, and and the, the choice of antisolvent could also potentially uh, affect the shape of your crystals, which connects back to the purity of the solids. Dosing of antisolvent is important. It can be done more carefully to avoid these chaotic uh, nucleation and, and rapid growth, looking at the amount and the rate of addition, and the, the concentration of the alcohol, for example, in, uh, in addition. Um, operating and mixing techniques are also important to consider. Um, maybe you want to add the antisolvent close to the impeller, where you have a very good mixing, for example. Also to, to try to counteract the very high supersaturation at the injection point. Uh, we want to investigate the mechanisms of impurity incorporation, of course. You could study aging and agglomeration phenomena. Working with seeding is important and the design of equipment is also something that can be discussed and you can have different choices there. So what we did, uh, Edward measured the solubility of the possible impurity phases as a starting point to see when do we actually exceed the solubility limits? Maybe that could be why we found uh, some of these elements in, in the solid phase. So it's a good starting point to measure the solubility also of the impurity phases that you could expect. And we see that um, uh, these are in comparison with the scandium phase. We, we, we do have quite low solubility of the iron and aluminium phases but a bit higher of the zirconium phase. But of course, we have to remember that the starting concentration of all these elements, the impurity elements, uh, are much lower than the scandium phase. So actually, even if the solubilities are lower, uh, this solution could be undersaturated with the impurities due to their low concentration. And so we, we compare the initial iron and aluminium concentration with the solubility curves, and we see that, yes, the solutions will be uh, undersaturated in the beginning of uh, introducing, in this case, ethanol into the solution. Um, so, but at some point, we will actually exceed the uh, solubility limits and we will have incorporation of the impurities just due to that fact. So there is a trade-off uh, in, in yield and purity here in this case that we have to think about. So to sum up a little bit, we see that earth elements can be um, selectively separated from leach liquor with a high yield by addition of an alcohol. Earth elements can be obtained as salts with a high solubility in water suitable for further processing, or you can obtain a specific phase that might be difficult to obtain in other, another way, like in our case, we wanted a fluoride phase that was suitable for metal production. The antisolvent can affect the shape of the crystals. We didn't talk too much about that, but it's also an interesting aspect. Uh, we have to avoid high supersaturation at the point of addition. Uh, 
choice of anti-solvent is important for different reasons. Uh, we have to look at the economy, availability, safety and recovery. The alcohols can be recovered by, for example, distillation, but there are also other approaches. Uh, and then they can be re recirculated and re reused as anti-solvent and the same for the acid possibly remaining. Um, so that's it. Uh, I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Um, and we acknowledge funding from different sources here. And I want to just thank all of my colleagues that have also worked uh, very hard with uh, this. Together we, we work with this and we find it very interesting. Okay, thank you so much. Now I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Kirsten. That was very informative, um, really valuable, especially with the rare earths, um, such an interesting and important topic these days. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciated that discussion. There is a question from the Q&A. Um, the question is, the EU is rather strict on transporting chemicals over borders. How did you manage to transport the ammonium scandium hexafluoride to Sweden from Germany? Hmm. It was actually pos possible to, to transport some of it. It was quite, um, it, we, we did fill in some specific paperwork. So I guess the first time it took some extra, extra time, but it, it, was, it was possible. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, I don't see any other, um, questions in the, the q and A. I I have a question for you, um, please. So you discussed the impurity incorporation into the solid phase. Um, how easy is it to manipulate, if you do have impurities in the solid phase, how easy is it to manipulate the particle size and shape, and then to separate the rare earths from the impurities by means of solid-solid separation? Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure about the solid-solid separation in this case. Um, of course, it depends. In some cases, if you have the impurities crystallizing at se as separate compounds, <clears throat> uh, for example, if you exceed the solubility limit or, or somehow you, you manage to crystallize them as separate phases, it could be more easy to separate in the, when, when you have the, the solid product. <clears throat> but if they are in... Uh, just uh, incorporated into the, the main solid phase, uh, it could be more difficult than I guess you would have to, yeah, you could wash them first of all, uh, but then you, you, you just would have to, to re-dissolve the solid and recrystallize perhaps. Uh, but maybe it's better not to have them there from the beginning if you, if you take care in your crystallization process. Okay, I, I have one last question that I would like to ask your opinion on. So you did mention also that um, you focus heavily on the recycling of metals within the, the flow diagram that you showed. Have you considered the recycling of reagents like um, the sodium hydroxide or the, the acid that you are using? Have you, have you evaluated it and is there any economic viability in it? Yes, we for the for the nickel metal hydride battery uh, project, we we had a life cycle assessment part, and and there we also actually investigated experimentally um, using nanofiltration after the leaching step to to get some acid back, and and at the same time concentrate the leach liquor a little bit more. So we had a, a nanofiltration after uh, leaching. And uh, we could get some acid back, um, but, uh, but uh, I, I don't think it was such a big gain actually, uh, because uh, still the, the lifetime of the membranes in this uh, quite acidic environment was not very good, that the lifetime that we had to use for our life cycle assessment. So I, if I remember correctly, it was not a, a recommended option to do that within that process at, at the time. But that's one option to get back some of the acids after leaching. Uh, but then uh, also in the antisolvent crystallization part, we have also uh, Edward investigated distillation, uh, getting 
back at uh, ammonium fluoride, uh, quite pure solution, because in that case we mainly had scandium in ammonium fluoride, we added ethanol, and then after precipitation we could uh, recover ammonium fluoride and ethanol um, and recycle, to recycle. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I do see a few other questions. Um, so the question is, if scandium is used in iron alloys and aluminium alloys, how pure must your product be? Um, in other words, how far away are you from acceptable grade? Yeah, it's a very good question because actually it's a little bit interesting to, to think about that, that some elements are more crucial than others as, as impurities. When you, you make the metal, <clears throat> some, uh, some uh, impurity elements are not at all a problem in, in the later stages because they are just removed within that process kind of while others are more problematic. So it depends, I guess each metal has a kind of a, an acceptable limit there. Um, and I don't remember actually now these, these values on the top of my head, but, but it is something that at least depends on which element you have, how, how serious it is if you have it. But we could uh, achieve uh, the purities that we had set as a goal in our project as, as much as that, I can say, by playing with the yield and, and the purity in our case. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure we can even work more to, to control the, the, the process. And that is what Edward is now also working with a little bit more to try to see how we can design the crystallization process in the best way uh, to, to, to crystallize uh, pure, pure scandium, ammonium scandium fluoride. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, how important is the upstream leach liquor and its preparation for your processing step? Mm, how important is the... Uh, it's all, always important. I mean, I think every step you should do the best you can in the leaching. You, you don't want to have a, any valuable components in your leach residue, perhaps, and... and um, you want to have quite high concentration uh, in, in crystallization. If that would be the next step, then if you want to crystallize a concentrate from the leach liquor, um, it is, I guess, always good to have a high concentration of, of um, your components, the elements you want to crystallize. But yeah, it depends. Depends if you are precipitating a concentrate of earth elements um, hmm. Yeah, it, it is difficult to say generally, I guess, what you would want. Okay, thank As you for that. It's not too important for, for these antisolvent crystallizations. Okay, thank you very much for that. I think the last question is, um, so if, if we can consider selective precipitation from um, of rare earths from impurities. Is it at all possible to selectively precipitate several rare earths from each other? So mm. to precipitate a rare earth from a, a group of rare earths, is that at all possible? Mm. I think perhaps at, at, to some extent you could, but I think if you want to separate the rare elements from each other, I would instead recommend probably solvent extraction or, or chromatographic separation. The, these should be better alternatives because they are, uh, rare earth elements are very, very similar properties. So it's uh, a little bit challenging with this technique. Mm. That makes sense. Um, thank you very much for your answers. I'm quickly scanning through um, the questions. Okay, um, Prof. Gerson, thank you so much for your very insightful talk. We are honored to have you. Um, thank you for joining us um, today, all the way from um, your, your IC environment. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to reading more of your work and contri contribution to the field of um, rare earth elements. Thank you so much. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us.
Okay, thank you very, very much. It was very nice to be here and I'm very glad to have everyone listening. So thank you a lot for the, uh, that, <laughs> giving Perfect. me the opportunity. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Prof. Kirsten. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.